Hello there, this is Michelle Lin. I'm from Academic Life and Emergency Medicine, and today we have the pleasure of having on with us Dr. Donald Yeely, who is the first author of the recently hotly debated uh, process trial. He's the chair and professor over at University of Pittsburgh, and thank you for joining us here, Don. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Well, let's just get right into the middle of this uh, process trial. I wanted to hear, you know, from you, first author yourself, like how would you summarize what you found from the process trial? So the purpose of the trial was not to uh, redo the Rivers trial from 11 or 12 years ago. It was to assess in a contemporaneous fashion what were the best ways to approach the initial resuscitation of patients who had septic shock beginning uh, in the emergency department. Uh, there had been many publications after the original Rivers trial, which occurred at one site. A lot of those were off-on designs where historical controls were used. We thought it was important to have a concurrent control in a large group of hospitals and to test today where the background care has changed, how we give antibiotics, how we manage ventilator settings, how we manage glycemia. There's been a lot more interest in sepsis care so it made it important to re-examine a couple different ways to do resuscitation in this changing background. And what we found is it's important to recognize septic shock, it's important to treat it and to treat it early, and it's important to do that aggressively, but the path in which you resuscitate is less important than recognizing septic shock, giving antibiotics, and making sure you understand that fluids and pressors have to happen aggressively. It's not that the path is unimportant, but it's a little less important than the overriding issues. Well, great. That is a, a great summary. And I just wanted to welcome in here, it looks like uh, one of our associate editors here, Salim Rezaei. Hey, how you doing, Salim? Welcome. Good. How are you guys doing? Good. Thanks for hopping into the call. We just started with Don here with the first question of summarizing the process trial. And, uh, and I kind of wanted to jump in and piggyback on with that question because of a timeless factor. The, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign just came out a few days ago with their official response to the process trial saying that, you know, as great as the findings are and, and going into methodologies, uh, they were still going to recommend the full sepsis bundle, including um, uh, central venous monitoring and SVO2 monitoring. And I was wondering if you had any uh, response to that, Don. Well, so this is the latest iteration in the Surviving Sepsis campaign. There have been multiple iterations. And we fully embraced the non-resuscitative aspects, actually. We counted on our sites and our physicians who were involved in embracing all the other actions, early antibiotics, appropriate antibiotics. Uh, we focused primarily on the resuscitative aspects. Uh, our trial is the largest contemporaneous uh, trial that looks at the resuscitative aspects. And our findings are actually congruent with what was seen by Alan Jones a few years ago published in um, JAMA. Mm -hmm. And we agree with the vast majority of the surviving sepsis campaign. We're just offering an opportunity to refine the part that deals with central venous monitoring. While 60% roughly of our control group and our intermediate arm had a central venous catheter, that means 40% didn't. And the people who got the catheters, if you look in the supplemental tables, got them much later, and virtually no one had it done to monitor oxygen saturation. So it's not like there was some subterfuge and goal-directed therapy happening in a clandestine fashion. Uh, my view is, is that if 40% of the population doesn't need the catheter, and the 60% who get it, get it later based on judgment, it's kind of hard to make that a routine metric of quality. And we think that it's reasonable to reconsider that. Obviously, there are two other trials uh, in Britain and in Australia that are asking a very similar question. They're about the same size as process, but in completely different backgrounds that may provide more information. Uh, but we think we've get, done a pretty good job at addressing that particular question right now. Right, and it sounds like the sample size for your group is going to be much larger than their two trials as well. Is that correct? Uh, I wouldn't say much larger, but a little bit larger. Uh, those two trials are each two-arm trials, and we have a three-arm trial. They're targeting somewhere around 1,000 patients each. Uh, I could be off. Uh, what is really interesting, I think, that most folks listening won't know is that we've been harmonized with those trials from the beginning. And by harmonized, I mean we have 
very similar data points for collections so that when each trial is done, we'll actually be able to put together a bigger data set with much more consistency for evaluation. So in a couple of years, we can even examine some more granular questions. That's a very novel approach. Most times, everybody does their own independent trial in different geographic locations, and you struggle afterwards to put things together. Great, thanks. I can actually think of only one reason why we should do the complete full sepsis bundle, just, just from the pure educator and me. All of our residents are losing central line procedures because of this, and, uh, and so they're just a little sad. But it's the right thing for patient care, um, so, well, so I look forward to it. And I guess my point is uh, goal-directed therapy is one reasonable pathway. We did not define it as being harmful. It also was not clearly superior, so our message is not don't ever do early goal-directed therapy as described by Dr. Rivers. It, our message is you have some flexibility and choices that, that give you other pathways towards the same good results. It's not like one was dramatically better or caused harm that we could detect. Great. Hey, Celine, do you have a question for Don? Yeah, I sure do. So I noticed as I was looking over the participating hospitals, uh, majority of them were academic hospitals where you would think that most of the physicians were already practicing early goal-directed therapy, um, at least in principle. Um, do you think that this is what, what is happening in community hospitals as well? So my first comment is while all of our sites were academic sites, none of them had an aggressive or consistent use of any structured resuscitative protocol. They may have had other parts of the sepsis bundle like early antibiotics and recognition. We did not have a singular site who was consistently using a structured resuscitation. There are some very well-known sites that were not part of our trial for that exact reason. We never asked anyone to dial back what they were doing. So in fact, uh, the idea that many people were doing the full early goal-directed therapy approach is actually not so true. And there's a couple other studies that, that uh, pointed that out through the 2000 to 2010 era, that people talked about it but often did bits and pieces of goal-directed therapy. And we did an, our trial to show if, in fact, is there a different approach to that that could be helpful. And, and that's what our middle arm is, if you think about it. It's a structured arm without the venous oxygenation driving care. Great. So what I want to know, because while we have you hostage here on our video, is, you know, what can you share with us behind the scenes or things that you could share with our readers, viewers, about what was not in your paper um, that maybe you can divulge? Well, um, doing clinical research on this scale is an amazing undertaking. This was seven years of our lives. And wow. I had fabulous partners, beginning with Dr. Angus and the rest of the team at Pitt and uh, a multitude of site investigators. And you know, you can't say it enough how hard it is to do this work without patients who are willing to be part of a trial. Everybody consented. And the individual sites participating. While we had 31 sites, they didn't all enroll for the entire period of time. We had to ramp up. Some sites had to leave and couldn't follow on. Uh, but we enrolled about a patient a month. And at first that says, wow, that must be really slow. A lot of clinical trials recruit slower than they expected. But if you look at any other large sepsis trial, about a patient a month is actually really a fairly brisk recruitment unless it's a single site where there's one uh, motivated investigator. So those are two points I'd, li I'd like to just uh, share with folks about how hard it is to do this and how easy it is to complain about recruitment, uh, recognizing uh, all the difficulties when you're trying to consent people in all different types of locations. Sure. I can only imagine how much work it takes given that, you know, we're just trying to even herd 48 residents. I can't imagine on, on your scale of trying to manage 31 sites. So, so kudos to you. Um, Salim, next. Yeah, so you kind of already hinted at this. You said there's a couple more trials that are coming up in the near future, um, and I, I didn't realize that they had very similar endpoints uh, with the process trial. Do we have any idea uh, where we're at or how soon those studies will be coming out? They have different primary outcomes, but we each measured, measured each other's endpoints. So our primary outcome was 60-day in-hospital mortality. Theirs is 90-day all-cause, but you recognize from our paper we reported that. What we harmonized was the data collection points. Now you asked when would they be coming out. I think both of those trials in both Britain and in Australia are nearing the three quarters to 100 percent enrollment uh, area. So I would expect 
inside of um, somewhere between nine and 12 months that those trials will be completed and available for analysis. I don't know anything more specific than that. Got it. Great. What I know there's been a lot of buzz talking about this trial now, and I wanted to, to give you this forum to address any potential misperceptions about your study that, that maybe you can share with the audience. Okay, uh, so we've talked about a couple already about enrollment must have been really slow and uh, people not understanding the sites that while they may have embraced sepsis care, there really was no ongoing background structured resuscitative care. We just didn't have that. We excluded sites who did that. Um, I think the other more important thing is, is that our goal was not to refute any previous findings. It really was to refine what's going on. And what we found is that there are, you know, these three different pathways produce very similar results that are all, all better than what we saw a decade ago. And the same day our trial came out in JAMA was an important paper from Australia showing that the same basic outcomes, improved sepsis mortality, uh, existed. So I don't think this is just a quirk of one study. Uh, we really have gotten better and we need to keep our foot on the gas. We're not saying don't pay attention to resuscitation. We're saying pay attention. Don't fret so much about the individual method that you use, but pay attention to it. Recognize septic and septic shock and give antibiotics. Great. Celine? Yeah, was there anything any like specific element of the study that you were surprised by or not expecting? You know, the honest answer is no. Um, I did not have any idea how the outcomes would would uh, play out. Uh, we didn't know anything until December 18th, which was uh, almost six months after the last enrollment because of uh, the data cleaning and integrity process. And our goal was to be as rigorous as possible and let the observed data drive everything. I, you know, I didn't have a personal dog in the fight, so there really wasn't any surprise. Um, and I'm not surprised that the overall mortality has dropped because in the interim we've seen other publications that had noticed that 46 and 30 percent mortality that Dr. Rivers reported really hasn't been replicated recently. And, and that's a good thing. That means that Dr. Rivers opened her eyes to how powerful early intervention can be. And, that's an important thing to recognize. Without his work, we're not here today. And our work doesn't refute his. It really refines it. Well, great. I, let's just wrap this up because I know you're, you're very busy. And I, I, we really appreciate you joining us in this chat. And so for my simple mind, it sounds like the take-home point is find, identify sepsis early, fluid resuscitate, give antibiotics early. Does that kind of sum it up? That is correct. And worry less about how you're doing these things. Uh, what's more important that you are doing them and that you recognize the risk of under recognition and under treatment. Great. Well, with that, I think we can just end it right there. And uh, thank you all for your time. And, and thanks, Don, for joining in. Thank you for the invite. Take thank care. You.